With the newly printed Ghost of Salt Marsh, uh, there's bound to be a lot of aquatic adventures on the horizon for a lot of players. Aquatic campaigns are seldom ran, though. Uh, they typically get a bad rap, somewhat deservedly so, whether it be because of their inherent difficulty from fighting underwater or just being surrounded by water, or perhaps just the worry of being little more than a piece of sailing equipment. Much like debris in the ocean, uh, these things can be hard to spot at first, but once you do, uh, they're very easy to avoid. So let's go through some tips that will help you break waves as opposed to just tread water. Merfolk, pirate treasures, long lost cities, and monstrous sea creatures. Aquatic and seafaring campaigns can take you to places that aren't often seen in typical D&D settings. And that's personally why I chose to run one recently. And it went pretty successfully. Some hiccups along the way, but I'm going to be using that experience a little bit to help talk about some of these topics. Now, of course, you cannot design a character for every situation, but what you can be certain of is that your DM will be using the ocean as pretty much one of your many adversaries. Uh, fifth edition sort of streamlined underwater combat for the most part, but there are still some builds that will have some trouble if battle beneath the waves is commonplace. Firstly, if you go overboard, how do you plan on swimming? If you sink, how do you plan on breathing? Your DM is likely to provide you with water breathing potions, magical items, or some other water breathing MacGuffin or story element if they intend to go, you know, fully aquatic with it and everything. But for more seafaring adventures or like a pirate themed adventure, you may be expected to kind of fend for yourself if you go overboard. Here's the official 5e rules for suffocating. A creature can hold its breath for a number of minutes equal to one plus its constitution modifier minimum of 30 seconds. When a creature runs out of breath or is choking, it can survive for a number of rounds equal to its constitution modifier, a minimum of one round. At the start of its next turn, it drops to zero hit points and is dying, and it can't regain hit points or be stabilized until it can breathe again. For example, a creature with a constitution of 14 can hold its breath for three minutes. If it starts suffocating, it has two rounds to reach air before it drops to zero hit points. What this means for your character is that unless you've got a good expectation of getting a water breathing ability or a good constitution score uh, later down the road, starting out with a good constitution score might be even more valuable than usual. Uh, it's good advice in general, but avoid making constitution your dump stat for any seagoing campaign. For melee oriented players, you'll want to keep the following rules in mind. When making a melee weapon attack, a creature that doesn't have a swimming speed, either natural or granted by magic, has disadvantage on the attack roll unless the weapon is a dagger, javelin, short sword, spear, or trident. You're going to need to plan around this. Rogues and other dexterity based melee fighters shouldn't be too phased by this. Daggers and short swords are their toast and jam after all. Uh, for strength based melee fighters, this will become more of an issue though as most of your high damage die strength weapons are really nerfed underwater. You know, arguably realistically so. <laughs> Unless you're playing a Triton Barbarian, which, which doesn't sound too bad, you know, at least in concept, saying it out loud, uh, you'll have to settle for a two-handed wielding spear or tridents as your primary underwater battling tool. So it limits you a bit. Speaking of tridents, it's hard to think of a weapon that stylistically fits an aquatic setting any better. It's kind of a shame that the trident is strictly worse than a spear in the 5th edition then. Tridents are statistically identical to spears in 5e, except for the fact that they're martial weapons, so fewer classes have access to it. And it also costs slightly more gold uh, for some reason. And in real life, tridents are useful for catching your enemy's weapons off guard and disarming them, of course. But in 5th edition, they lack really any disarming rules. So, and this is probably why the trident feels underwhelming as a result. If you want to run a trident-wielding master in your next seafaring campaign, which also sounds awesome when I say it out loud, uh, ask your DM if you can, you know, get a minor improvement uh, in terms of disarming your opponent or perhaps... You know, you can increase the damage die by a step. Um, you know, just anything to make it a little bit more useful. In real life, tridents are useful for catching your enemy's weapon and then disarming them. Fifth edition, however, lacks any universal disarming rules. And this is probably why the trident feels underwhelming as a result. If you want to run a trident wielding master in your next seafaring campaign, be sure to ask your DM if you can get any sort of minor improvement 
to that weapon. Since you'll be seeing it so much, it probably deserves to have a little bit more importance in your campaign, you know, whether it be adding a disarming ability or just increasing the damage die by a step. Maybe it can be a weapon that's easily thrown when underwater, you know, just anything to make it a little bit more of an essential weapon, especially since it just fits with the campaign so aesthetically. Same reason you'd want to give like your ship special abilities and stuff like that if you're going to be focused around uh, moving from point A to point B and stuff like that. Range fighting underwater uh, has some restraints as well. Let's get into that. A ranged weapon attack automatically misses a target beyond the weapon's normal range. Even against a target within normal range, the attack roll has disadvantage unless the weapon is a crossbow, a net, or weapon that is thrown like a javelin, including a spear, trident, or dart. Obviously, your pinpoint longbow sniper is going to have some trouble, uh, but this is honestly less of a problem than it may seem at first. Unless you've specifically made a character that's, you know, a long-range sniper, this only affects shots that were going to be at a disadvantage anyway. It makes bad shots impossible, but it actually doesn't do anything to the good shots. Normal range for a longbow is 150 feet, and a short bow is 80 feet. I've found this most comes up with hand crossbows, which have a mere 30 foot of normal range. Just keep your range in mind while you roll your marksman in your next aquatic adventure. So just keep all this in mind if you plan on building a marksman character for your seafaring campaign. And finally, we arrive at the magic users, and here's where it all gets a bit wonky. Uh, because with 5e's streamlining, nothing in the rules is really written that directly addresses underwater spellcasting. There's a ton of very important distinctions, and there's nothing really to do except ask your DM. You know, does water count as an obstruction to fireball? You know, me personally, I would say yes, but would it explode in my hand? Does fire even work underwater? It, these are all things that you really just kind of have to hope your DM has considered, and if you don't think they have, bring it to their attention. The real kicker is verbal components. There's a lot of back and forth, but depending on how your DM rules, uh, casting spells that require verbal components underwater may be just straight up impossible. Before you roll up a spellcaster, figure out with your DM exactly how you plan on ruling aquatic spellcasting. Finally, there's one big problem to aquatic combat, and it's that your movement speed is heavily reduced. While climbing or swimming, each foot of movement costs an extra foot, two while an extra difficult terrain, unless a creature has a swimming or climbing speed. This means that without a swim speed, gains naturally or magically, as we've previously discussed, you're essentially moving through difficult terrain while in water, and super difficult terrain if the water is choppy. Try and wrangle up a swim speed, because it's going to be rough otherwise. Now, all of this must sound horrible, right? A set of extra restrictions that affects your ability to fight efficiently? Well, it comes with a pretty amazing trade-off, and that's flight. It's sort of flight. It's not exact flight. You're kind of floating, so this technically counts as a sort of free flight, and this can directly affect your tactical capabilities, including your ability to flank or get behind, underneath, or above your enemy. So. Perhaps if you can't find another way to properly beat your enemy, just outwit them by being able to fly around them ostensibly. All right. It does, however, come with a rather unfortunate negative, which is the opposite of flight. Uh, falling, or when it's underwater, we call that sinking. In very deep water, things can go horribly wrong very quickly if, for instance, you're stuck to something that's sinking, or if the force of something heavy is pulling you down under the water, or if you're just near abyssal depths and something is dragging you down there. Uh, I imagine that your DM will warn you of these kinds of hazards, but these seem like the kind of pitfalls that could be what we call insta-deaths. So just uh, be careful for that. And now I'm going to close out with some basic, more general tips on building your character for what I consider most campaigns. Uh, the first one is don't build your character around a ship. The new Ghosts of Saltmarsh book uh, for 5e created some new streamlined rules for ships and other vehicles. 
and it, it may be tempting to try and work your character's story around ships, uh, your abilities around naval combat, but trust me, you don't want to be the boat person. I've seen a few variations of this where players will build uh, their characters around siege weapons or airships, but the results tend to be the same. As we're all aware, campaigns are complicated stories, and it's unlikely that in any campaign beyond a one-shot that your situation will remain the same forever or even an extended period of time. So it feels awful to build a character who's all about ships only to get shipwrecked or teleported into the desert on your third session. Your DM can take you anywhere, and it's not wise to get too invested in your ship. That sort of creates unwanted stipulations on the campaign's trajectory. And also, DMs kind of love to wreck ships, so, you know, just watch out. Now, on the flip side of that, if your campaign does focus around a ship, and if you feel like you will be at sea for a long period of time, I cannot stress enough, have a downtime plan. This is good advice for any campaign, but it's especially true in seafaring campaigns that often have weeks or months of downtime sailing into far-off destinations. Have a downtime plan. It doesn't have to be anything in particular uh, or even that useful, though it would be great if it did. In my campaign, someone learned how to uh, cook. That was a very efficient thing. Uh, depending on your DM's personal item creation rules, you could even use this copious amount of time to like create magical items and things like that, new weapons. Uh, it kind of just depends on what your DM is willing to allow this downtime to be used for. I recommend taking a look at Unearthed Arcana downtime, which contains the current official rules for crafting magical items. Uh, they are restrictive, to say the least, but long sea voyages are about the only times really you can reasonably fit about 50 work weeks into the time to make a half decent magical item. So in terms of being able to craft things that would usually take a long period of time, I can't really think of a better setting for that than being on a ship in the middle of the water for a long period of time in game. Also from Unearthed Arcana downtime, we can get great uses for your tool proficiencies that most people seem to forget about in a more fast paced, you know, on land campaign. You could create life-saving potions uh, for healing and toxins for your herbalism kit. You can patch up and repair your party's armor uh, with leatherworks tools, or you can just make some boots out of something that you found in the water that day. You can tinker and craft new weapons or armor types and everything with your smith's tools. You can just make fancy jewelry from everyone. You can make upgrades to your ship. Even if your character doesn't make directly useful things, this is certainly a time that you can add more flavor to the campaign. Seafaring campaigns are very unique in their ability to capture a sort of whimsical yet grim tone. And I would argue that a sailor and some, in some ways what we understand to be pirate culture is defined by what these pirates did in their downtime. Have them carve, uh, you know, have your, if you're a bard, for instance, carve a scrimshaw or write a new sea shanty, ink some people with a new tattoo. There's definitely ways that the, you know, charismatic character can really fill the gaps in this universe. The bottom line is that when your DM says something like you're going to sail for the next two months, have something interesting at the ready to occupy your character's time and your campaign will feel way more organic as a result. I hope you found these tips useful on how to better build a character for a seafaring campaign. I hope to talk about this in the future from a DM's perspective. I recently ran a seafaring campaign that lasted a little bit over a year and I definitely learned a lot from that. And uh, more importantly, I learned things to avoid if I ever try to visit that setting again, which uh, I think I will. So hopefully I get to talk about this again. But I've been Patrick with Skull Splitter Dice, and I hope you've enjoyed the video.